Hello Pez fans, thanks for tuning in. With me today, I am very pleased to say, is the voice of cycling, the voice of international cycling, someone we all know <laughs> and, and I think most of us love. Phil Liggett is joining me in via Skype for a little interview. Phil, thank you so much for joining us. A pleasure to have you on Pez. Hey, it's great to be back. It's like you don't look any older than you did last time as well, which is a couple of years, I think. <laughs> Later on in this interview, Phil will reveal his, his own secret to looking so good. <laughs> so stay tuned for that. The first time I went to see the tour was 1990. And mm -hmm. I won, this, is, this was actually the year that you and I first met. And I wonder if you, I love recalling this story. And I've got a great little video that I'm going to slot in here about the time we first met. But do you remember what happened on the slopes of Mont Blanc after the stage? Do you really, I know you've had, had a million of these encounters. I can hardly remember being on one block. Well, this is, I'll paint this, this picture for you and see if you can, it comes back to you. So the stage had finished. You were covering this, the tour with Sam Posey for, I think yes. it was ABC. And I was, had ridden up Mont Blanc um, in, in like uh, Saint Gervais, I think it was. And, and we sort of stopped at our hotel. I was with a buddy. We watched the race go by. We missed the front of it, saw the end of it. Ah, whatever. We hopped on our bikes and rode up a little bit up the climb to the finish. And on the way back down, we saw you and Sam standing in a field uh, doing your end of day commentary, um, sort of a wrap up of the stage. And I, and I was like, oh my God, there's Phil Liggett. We got to go talk to him, you know, and so we, we were lugging this video camera that was about the size of a loaf of bread around the tour with us because that's the, how small they were back then. And so I approached you and asked you if you'd help us play a joke on my friends back here. And I pretended I was I, I, I was a rider in the race and I asked you if you'd interview me as if I was a, a rider in the tour. And of course, I was riding a mountain bike and wearing a T-shirt and just looked like an idiot. But you were fantastic. You totally played along with the gag. That was... I that was our first meeting. I can't really remember it, but it sounds exactly like the sort of thing I would do and have done, done since. And yes. um, Sam Posey, by the way, what was, a, was a great man. He always wrote his scripts by hand with a pencil. Wow. Never used anything else. And he wrote perfect prose. You couldn't rush him. And uh, they were good days, too. Yeah. yeah. So I think we got to have a little bit of a conversation of the tour. So I have being unable to sadly see you and and Paul do your wonderful commentary for the last two or three years now because my broadcasters here in Canada have have switched their feeds and we've got different broadcasters though I know you guys are still doing it I do miss you but uh you know as the tour goes on year after year I've seen 16 of been covering 16 of these things I've been a fan for a lot longer than that but you've been a fan for way longer than I have can you talk talk to us a little bit about the span of of how things have changed for that you've seen in the race. Yeah, I can. First of all, though, Richard, um, to explain the, the change of the voice that uh, I'll call on myself, because Paul completed his 40th tour this year, and I did my 46th. And yes, we're still doing the same, the same thing we always did, but only for NBC. What happened was a couple of years ago, ITV, which is our who I work for originally, they wanted to more of me in effect, or they were going to bring on their own crew, and that's the way they went. Uh, but a year later, the ASO, the organizers of the tour, uh, wanted to produce their own little feed directly, that wanted. Now, we were always working for NPC. People were buying in, not me, but buying in, uh, I presume buying in, uh, to our voices. And as a result, once they changed the transport outlets, they didn't get our voices anymore. So sadly, Paul and I were off uh, the world feed, as it were, so Australia, New Zealand, Canada. But it is nobody's direct fault. It's the fact the organisation wanted to do feed their way, and we couldn't work for both. Now, yeah, you're right. I started out like everybody else in the world, a pure fan of cycling. I wanted to be a pro cyclist, because I was training as a journalist from 1967. And in 1970. Uh, to it would have been. A journalist asked, said he was going to cover the tour every day, only done in Britain before, for television. Uh, he was on part during the week for a weekend transmission, and his name was David Saunders. And he said, I can't pay you any fees at all, but I will pay your expenses. Would I be his driver on the Tour de France? 
1973. That's how it all began for me. I, 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 whatever Cyprus is, day does. Look at what they've got into and and believe they've never seen such a big um, in their careers. I never got to ride it, of course. I got to write about it. So it is the biggest sporting event. It still attracts the love of people and the passion. Um, it's transferring because money became involved. And I think the money factor came in when Gregor Mond sort of signed that $5.5 million yeah. dollar deal with Z. That was money makes people more aggressive. It changes tactics. It changes lifestyles. And it's no longer the Tour de France uh, of the romantics of where it began. And so, for better or for worse, we have what we have now. I said that. I think we had a great Tour de France. For you as a fan, was there one era that you have seen or watched where you feel uh, that was your favorite era, or as a fan, that was the best time or the golden age of, of modern cycling? I think first is always best with whatever you do in life. After that, it slowly becomes old hat of your life. So the first so five, seven years of the Tour de France um, were just special. I, it, there was two races, the car race and, of course, the bicycle race. Everybody wanted to be in the right position. You were in amongst the riders in the cars coming down the mountains, which I never did like, and I, I was so pleased at night to get back to the hotel and tick the stage off, I'm still alive. Because one year on the tour, seven people died. Mechanics, police, they were just getting too tired to drive the tour route. Wow. And that was in the 70s. At the same time, the tour was losing its popularity. But that's all changed now. The, the tour is more popular than ever. Basically, the tour this year was a bit more exciting than previous years. Um, and now we're all talking about style too strong. So the world is out of the sky. Everybody's got their own ideas on how to be sky. Hey, 10 years ago, I would have, I would have prayed for somebody like Sky to fly the flag for Great Britain. Yeah. I never thought in my career I would ever compensate on a push win for the Tour de France. Now I've done that six in the last seven years or something. It's yeah. It, it out of hand now. Um, so now, of course, like everything we do in life, the more good, better you get at your job, then they love you. But when you get really too good, they want you out the way. Whatever you do, and that happens to Sky right now. Yeah. Uh, Gerard Thomas, a fabulous winner, the wonders whale. You so you started in 1971, I think you said was your first tour. No, uh, 73 was my first tour de France. I started in Scaveningen in Holland by the Hague, and being very naive, I hadn't spent much time in Europe in my life at that time in, in 73. I thought the, sh the sun always shone from start to finish. Louis O'Connor dominated, he was absolutely brilliant. Merckx didn't ride, we expected it to clap, that never happened. And it was a great race, but every lunchtime we'd just lay on the grass somewhere and we'd have our lunch. But in those days you could, now we're far too busy. And it'll never happen again. But yeah. Travel around the tour is a fairly big undertaking, just getting from stage to stage. And after you do it so many times, it it's not the same as when you did it the first time. There's a certain amount of uh, adventure and and um, savoir faire, you know, traveling around France, chasing this amazing bike race. But after you've done it so many times, what's the what's it like from your perspective? How has that changed? It is a long day now because in those days we never had live commitments. I would write a small story for a newspaper. I'd do my driving job and I had no TV commitments. And the guy I was driving, he only commentated on some days, but not every day. But now we're live every day and very often from start to finish. So now they're very full days, but they go quickly. Um, and you, I don't get tired because I stay hyped and switched on, the same with Paul Sherwin. Uh, and I have to say this um, the NBC uh, actual production team are pretty special people. They're not all American, they've got all nationality South African, they're from France and Belgium. And their enthusiasm overrides the tiredness because they must be tired. Yeah. We work, the crew call is at 8.30 on the finish line every day. Sometimes earlier, one day it was 6 a.m. because of the time of start. And then we're off at 6.30 at night. It's all local time, obviously. And then we have to drive to the next finish, which could be 200 kilometers away or more. And so we're going to sometimes bed at uh, between 11 and 12.30 at night. Uh -huh. and 
trying it again at 8.30. Uh, and we'll, you've got to have time to get your notes today, get your thoughts together. They've got to go and get all the production together. So the way to rock and they've got to get, get the start line through that gets down to get the interviews of the day and the storyline put into the show later on. Uh, it's they're all locked in. They are they've got what we call tour fever. Yeah. It's a job and they're great at their job. How many people are there on the Tour de France production crew for NBC? On the on the ground, I believe it's fifty five, sixty people. Wow. In France with us, we've got the production team back home in, uh, in Stanford connected with as well. And yeah, it's and they're all working, especially in America, because in America they're going to be off in the middle of the night yeah. to catch the pace coming in. Now, it's ravaged by modern cycling, it's ravaged by the problems of the day, the, the traffic furniture, the racing is by nature dangerous. It's a much more competitive instinct now that sprints have to be quite dangerous now. Um, but I like to see it as a, a growing up of the of the of the event uh, for better or worse. You ain't gonna blow it down. Do you see a, a point in the future where the Tour de France could ever possibly come to an end? <laughs> well, I guess all good things come to an end. Uh, uh, it could be the Prime Minister or be a, a sporting event, but there's an awful lot of people says it won't. But of yeah. course, the cost is now enormous. Without the benefactors and the sponsorship, in fact, the ASO and the sports organisation have to make a profit to offset the other races they organise. Um, one day it might be too expensive. I certainly hope not. Another question for do you and Paul, are you guys roomies when you're on the tour? Or do you get your own room? <laughs> uh, we used to be, we used to all share a room just for the same reason cyclists shared the room. Yeah. Sharing when I took him on board uh, back in 85 yeah. uh, was, was still a pro. And he's just coming off the continent and moving into Britain where he went to be cycled before he stopped. And uh, we used to share the room on the Tour de France because we talked to each other mm-hmm. and we told stories. He told stories of the tours and his pro career and I told stories of being a journalist. I remember his, after the first weekend of his first weekend on the tour with me, uh, he was going to bed on the second night at midnight and he just uh, said, I'm absolutely, he said, honestly, Oh, you guys did your job and went and had a pint at the bar, went to bed and did the same thing next day. He said, it's not quite like that, is it? I said, no. He says, I'm absolutely happy. <laughs> and that was two days into the tour. Um, but we, like you, we fall in love with it. What happened was that after about five or six years, in the um, television company we primarily work for, which is, which is TV, started putting us in, cutting the budget, putting us in cheap hotel. Okay. Um, when you're going to fall over your mate's suitcase to go to the toilet at four in the morning <laughs> and the games. I looked at them and said, it's all over. Separate rooms now. And from the next night on, we separate rooms. That was so cool. We used to go to sleep lapping our heads up, you know. Yeah. Which is what Paul, when he was on the teams, was kept on the top team. Not, he was obviously good, but he rode because he had to, he never got bad morale. And if he had a teammate who crashed, or he was getting low because his form wasn't coming, he'd be told to sleep with that guy tonight. Yeah. And he that. The best times of these things are A, having the adventure, and then the second best time is reliving the adventure with through those stories at the end of the day. Whether you're, it doesn't matter, kids, if it doesn't matter what age you are, right? It's just still the same. No, and you've got to keep the pressure off yourself. We joke our way up our fans, and, and the car crew loves us because. We're, we're not posh talent to sleep in the camper van. <clears throat> we never speak to the people that do the real work. We mix with them and we have great fun with them. Yeah. Uh, and we keep everybody's mail in the same place if they're in a bad way. That's the way it's got to be. The tours, well, like Tour de France, it's a family. This year, for example, we, uh, we drove, uh, uh, I'm, I'm converting to kilometers, 6,200 kilometers this year. We drove. Yeah. <laughs> Keep up with a race that was 3,300 kilometers long. And I feel you, man. I know, I know what those those drives were like. I've never covered an entire tour myself, and I'm usually I think about the longest I've done is 13 days or something, and it is exhausting. So well, but, you know, it, the drive, the stories, the size, keeping up with the race, reading yeah. all the papers, staying on top. Yeah. It's a challenge. It's always. We always say to each other every year, and I always tell newcomers on the tour team, remember. Sunday, you'll still be on the same race in four Sundays from now. So don't burn yourself out on yeah. day two. 
and that's the best advice you can give somebody. Yeah, I may have to edit this question out, but what is your age? It's, I think pe people are always like, how? Because you've been around for such a long time, but you don't. You just you're not aging. You look fantastic. I love you. That's what a lot of people say. I'd like to find out how I found the elixir. But anyway, uh, I'm 74 as we speak. Okay. In four days, and I'll be 75. So um, what can I say? You can't stop age, but you can stop being your age. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. I, get, I get that a lot too. I get that a lot too. What do you think? Here's one. What do you think about this podium girl situation? They've got some of the races have removed them, some have kept them. Uh, do you have an opinion on this thing? You've been around through so many eras of this. You've kind of seen it, I think, as a tradition better than a lot of the newer fans have. Uh, personally, I don't have an opinion. I don't. The women who want to be up there. Why shouldn't they be up there? Uh -huh. That's what they are. Women are, they dress prettily to be attractive for men. That's the way, and the birds change the colours like the male is better dressed than the female in bird life. So I've got nothing against birds being, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> being <laughs> why shouldn't they be? That's their job. People looking at attractive people is not going to stop. Whether they're on a stage or not on a stage, human nature is we will continue to our eyes will be captured by people who we find attractive beautiful well, it's may have passed by something but we are still human beings exactly true yeah. enough true enough we're living in a different time now i think for sure so there's a lot of influences on 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 certain traditions that didn't exist before and and it's just well it's the way it is it's right now oh, so. <laughs> Phil, I listen, I'm feeling the pressure of talking to a guy of your stature, and I'm like, I can't get my, there it is, I think this bloody thing's working now, I sure as hell hope it is. <laughs> yeah, good, okay, awesome. Simon, now he's just completed his 10th day in the Tour de France. How are you feeling, Richard? I'm feeling pretty good, to tell you the truth, Phil. Uh, I thought you'd have cleaned your bike. Well, I found that with the thicker tires and a little heavier frame, I was able to take a few shortcuts, which some of the officials didn't see yet. So I managed to stay up, up on GC. And I'm yeah, but listen, the good. race finished three and a half hours ago. These shortcuts don't work, do you? Well, I'll say this much. There's still a lot of good-looking girls at the top, and that's what counts. <laughs> <laughs>